All right, welcome everyone. Welcome back. We're now at the beginning of the Vegan Collective Intelligence portion of the Solution Club. And I'm happy to turn it over to Silas, who's going to give us uh, a, you know, an abstract and, and lead a discussion specifically related to your white paper. Welcome back, Silas. So happy to have you here and please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jamin. Yeah, so the white paper was released last week and uh, it uh, it's the Vegan World 2026 white paper, so it explains the, the rationale behind the project and why we are doing what we are doing and what our vision is. So the title of the white paper is Birthing a Post-Pandemic Vegan World. So we are in a birthing process. So that's how we are framing the story. So let me just read the summary or the abstract. So it says, unlike past inflection points in human history, this one caused by the COVID-19 pandemic calls for a fundamental rethinking of our relationship with animals and nature. So in this white paper, we define vegan as vitally engaged guardians of animals and nature and show that an exponential transformation to a vegan world is already underway. And that mainstream attempts to denigrate the V word are like social distancing to impede this transformation. So we propose a mathematical model for the growth of the vegan movement, along with two concrete interventions to maximize its growth rate and minimize the asymptotic residual carnism in a post-pandemic vegan world. We propose a new story for humanity, along with a new Aquarius game that we can play in, in lieu of the money game we play today in order to coordinate our actions in a vegan world. Finally, we examine the seven core shifts along with the institutions and infrastructure that we have to nurture in order to transition from our crumbling, unsustainable global industrial society to a robust, thriving post-pandemic vegan world. So anyway, the link is on the chat and um, please read the um, details. So that's just the summary. And so uh, try to put together our thoughts, I mean, my thoughts, and it's up for uh, editing by the group, you know. So it's just my first cut at putting it together. So um, I guess Suzanne and Benjamin are not here today, so I will try to conduct this meeting to the best of my ability. I'm not so good at it as they are, <laughs> but, but I'll do my best. By the way, so I'm, anyway. I'm, here, I'm here to help if you'd rather be just yourself and not worry about conducting. I, I'm happy to conduct, but totally up to you, Silas. Ball's in your court. I'm here to help any way you need. No problem. Thank you. Um, so for the agenda, uh, we wanted to talk about Kipwise. We wanted to talk about um, the Beyond Animal Platform that we are considering for um, transitioning our base camp to. And I also want to bring to our attention the, um, another new platform that I was um, told about today, this morning, I found out about it. And it's called Citizens for a Healthy Earth. And so this is being started by the people who did Codes for a Healthy Earth. And so they have created a platform that includes um, a forum for discussing and, and uh, groupings and then it also has spreadsheets it has it has a slack like uh, software so it has a whole bunch of apps that are available including email app and uh, it's all being hosted on a secure server and it's all being done through um, all open source software so uh, I, apparently it's this is the platform that extinction rebellion has been using and Citizens for a Healthy Earth is adopting that. And they, are, they want to pitch to us their platform. So they want to show what they have, they have so far and invite us to be the first major group on that platform and nurture the platform as we go along. So we become like a test case. Uh, and the attraction of this is it is a nonprofit. It's being run by... Um, by it basically open source software, which is, which is what we are planning for our future anyway. We want everything to be open source anyway. 
So that's the attraction of it. So I want to give it a shot. Um, and I've invited, uh, I've, I've told Shelly and Yan that I will ask the group permission that we host a presentation from them on this. They don't want to go public at the moment, so they don't want it to be recorded. And so they want to just uh, show it to us. So whenever it's convenient for us, maybe you know, we can schedule it over the next week. So that's one item. And then um, uh, Suzanne and Ben have sent an email. So they have a couple of items that they are working on. They're working on uh, Kipwise. So they've put a couple of docs for us to look at. So those are in the emails that she, they sent out. Maybe I'll share my screen and we can take a look at it. Oh yeah, one second, Silas. I just need to enable screen share. Okay, it's enabled. Okay. So I guess the white paper is on it. And um, so I have updated this white paper, so I'll, I'll probably get the uh, updated version of it on. I updated it with all the comments that we got on uh, Basecamp and the comments that I've been getting from JF. So I released that also last week. So we'll put that up on, um, I mean, basically, we are evaluating this as a way to do um, group collaboration. So we can edit this document, and the multiple people can edit it, and then we can have a uh, public face for it. So that's one. And then they've started an animal free farming website on Wix. Yeah, this is exactly what uh, actually Jane was talking about. Basically, we are talking about creating resources resources to help transition your dairy to a plant-based operation and resources for transitioning a chicken farm to a plant-based operation. So I think that's the intent of the animal free farming site is to create, um, collect resources that are publicly available already and put them in these categories so that people can come and browse to those resources and see, you know, if, I mean, this could include stories of other farmers who have done the transition, um, videos on how to plant trees, you know, depending on your condition, how to plant trees in clay soil, how to plant trees in loamy soil, etc. So, so this way, um, people have an idea of what they could be doing if they wanted to transition. So from a chicken farm, you should have a test case for how to, how to grow mushrooms and things like that. So anyway, we are uh, having a conference on this uh, next, not this Saturday, but the next Saturday. 
it'll be a conference that uh, that's from 10 to 12 and 1 to 3 and um, so we're inviting people who are in this space to join the panel so that we can we can just brainstorm um, what should go on this website besides the obvious things like test cases and stuff so um, a lot of people have been working on this so Rene pointed out that uh, that uh, the save movement has been working on it so Anita has been working on a brochure that people can hand out to the uh, truck drivers near slaughterhouses so that they can see that there are alternatives to what they're doing and so um, so, so that information can be put on this website as well. And, um, and then Free From Harm, Robert Grillo, has been collecting stories of farmers. So we are thinking of adding those stories also in, these, in this web page. Um, so I, there will be a meeting of just those of us who have been working on this together. And then we will have a public uh, discussion around it on next Saturday, May 30th. Okay. Um, all right, and then we will schedule the share. We will schedule the discussion with uh, uh, Shelly and Jan. Uh, sometime early next week, probably next Tuesday, you know, during the day. Because they are in Israel, so they need it to be early in the morning. Uh, Pacific time, so that it's convenient for them. So we'll schedule that. And then after that, um, Jamin has a question, but uh, I wanted to open, it, open the floor to others who have issues to discuss as well. Right, go ahead, Jamin. Thank you, Silas. Really good stuff. You know, I would I would say um, that with respect to the whole agriculture thing, um, one could look at each of those things still within a context of the current capitalist system and the current money system and free market, yada, yada, yada. You got money, you eat, you don't, you don't, etc. It could be looked at in that way. I'm not saying it is. And of course, in, in no way, shape or form, you know, uh, implying that, but here's what I'm saying. So, so, but just as context, so the one big missing piece for me is reinventing um, and doing the, you know, but the, the caterpillar to butterfly trans transformation for all of our food networks holistically, right? This is kind of a farm by farm. If you're a chicken farmer, do this, but you can still be playing the same Macarena dance as before. So, this would be sort of a separate topic unto itself, which is radical transformation of, of food networks and of food period, right? <laughs> you know, when we say food, what do we mean? Right now it means the four food groups, right? Three of which are non-vegan, <laughs> right? Or two of which are non-vegan, right? Um, so uh, redefining food and redesigning the food networks. Um, and that's, you know, that's what Operation Stone Soup, uh, Brooklyn Eats, that's what we're naming a particular vector in that direction of which there'll be many right and love to work together all of us together you know k mama app food healers climate healers all of us together and that's of course where the community of communities comes in but th this could be like a a specific hyper object of you know the radical transformation of food networks and of food <laughs> something like that anyway back to you silas uh, that's a good point and i um because you are looking so this website is more or less looking at it from the perspective of those who want to transition in the current system. How do you, uh, but then how do you make, start doing something that would be useful for the future? So not just for the current system. So uh, this is why we are going to have resources from uh, veganic farms, veganic agroforestry and things like that so that people can see that they could be expanding beyond just monocultures. Right. Um, I also wanted to do an update on uh, the K-Mama app. The software people have, um, so I have, um, so the website now has uh, SSL enabled. 
which took uh, took three or four days <laughs> because I, I accidentally decided to go for the deluxe option. So <laughs> because the deluxe option requires them to check everything, so they checked everything, <laughs> and it took them time. And uh, <laughs> so now apparently it's a uh, you know I have a deluxe SSL website. So. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, you know, there's strong security built in. Okay, people, people, people can be absolutely sure that this website is honest and real and whatnot, and it's completely uh, encrypted going in and out. Okay, um, I'm also beginning to see that uh, having a payment option within the app is a bit of a pain. So if we have to have payment option within the app, then you have to have every provider put their um, bank information. And depending on the country, it's different. Depending on the continent, it's different. I mean, you have all kinds of requirements. So I am thinking now of uh, doing without it, doing without any payment. So the only thing that Kmama would do is connect people who have free food available with people who want to eat free food, okay? And they both get, uh, you know, corona points for doing that, and they, they are, so there's no money involved whatsoever in this app. So that's what I'm thinking of going with, um, because that just simplifies things quite a bit. Because um, otherwise the regulations in Europe is different from the regulations in India, is different from the regulations in China, and you have to have different bank accounts. I mean, it's a mess. <laughs> uh, and you have to have a, you know stripe uh, you have to have stripe for each uh, provider uh, it's a mess and then each provider should ha have admin access for that stripe so they can look at their orders anyway forget it so i'm thinking that we'll simplify it and just have a it's like a craigslist that connects one the, the free food with providers with the free food uh, consumers okay and um, so then we have to get restaurants to sign up or the providers to sign up and then say that for anyone who orders any meal, whatever that meal is, you know, can you please tell us how many K-Mama meals you're going to provide? So if people order some menu item, they could say, you know, if you order more than 20 bucks, I'll put a K-Mama meal, whatever it is. And then they can choose, you know, to what is the scheme of a meal they're going to supply for the day. So, so this way, you they say how many free meals are available. So you can see free meals coming through, and then uh, people who want to eat can then say, "I want that meal," whatever it is. So, so you're connecting the two. It's a little bit like me, you know, supplying meals to um, Zuli. So it's like a a, a formal way of um, making that happen. So, so then I can also become a provider, you know, and say, I'll be happy to send meals to someone like Zuli. And I have five meals available per day. So people can then become their own providers. So this is just an informal network of connecting people with um, meals, right? So I think this will expand it beyond just um, restaurants. So that's my current thinking. I'm going to talk about it more in more detail on Friday. Um, but just looking at the code and looking at, uh, because these people, when they wrote the code, they assumed that I would have only, there's only one bank account and it's my account and everything goes to Climate Healers. So everybody from all over the world is sending money to Climate Healers and I'm disbursing the fund to all the restaurants. I said, no, that's not what I want. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I explained what I really want, they said, oh, that's going to cost a lot. That's a lot of complex stuff, <laughs> you know? So it just blows up. And so that's why I'm thinking about, thinking on the fly, <laughs> figuring out what to do. So uh, anyway, that's where we are. So you can see that when you start implementing an app, <laughs> you get all kinds of nitty gritty details you have to sort through. So that's my update. And I think, uh, does anyone else have anything to add? Any other agenda items that you want to discuss today? I have a question about the app. Uh, 
how does uh, PCRM's uh, universal meal option fit into it? Is oh, there yeah. right. going to be a certification yeah. process? And yeah, basically we... what we are saying is that the K-Mama meals have to be universal, uh, universal meals. Okay. So this way it's anywhere in the world you can supply. That's the idea that you can choose one uh, meal from the list of universal meals that are available. And we can keep adding to that list too. So there's a process that PCRM has, has put in place for that. But right now I think there are about a hundred, um, hundred odd recipes that they have come up with. So you can choose one of those and cook that and that will be a came out meal. So there is so some- it's not, the, not the fare from the restaurant themselves. They're not bringing their signature recipes to- Not yet, yeah. Right now it's all universal meals. That's what we are thinking. Not yet, meaning that they could eventually uh, develop, offer anything that, that uh, fits the universal meals? They can probably develop something that fits the universal meals and then submit the recipe to PCRM and have them stick it into their website if they want it. Uh, but maybe the maybe universal meals could also say, you know, if, you, if your recipe has this, this, this characteristic, then you it is universal meals compliant. So you don't really necessarily have to follow a, an existing recipe. So it, that's the idea, right? So you, so you have, so then there is a stamp, universal meal stamp on it, on the K-Mama meals, meaning it's PCRM approved and it doesn't have allergens. You don't have to think about those things. It doesn't have common allergens. Right. Um, so I mean, they were interested in partnering with us, you know, and then then you'll have the PCRM stamp of approval on this <laughs> app too. Let's see. Can we get my embryolic to uh, promote the app? Yeah. Then we'll get all that. You see, oh, because yeah. we're gonna have a weekly, uh, a monthly meeting of the PCRM, uh, the advisory committee. So we're going to bring this up during that monthly meetings. And uh, so they'll be involved in, you know, in promoting the app as well. All right, James uh, has his hand up. Yeah, th uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, you know, just a, just a suggestion there on the talk that I had there, um, uh, going on what you said there, um, Silas, about um, not bringing the money into it and um, going on restaurants uh, doing it as a, you know, it's a good idea to get the customer to order so many meals and or whatever, like, and they could also donate that way as well, you know what I mean? Um, right. Uh, but, and, the, and the restaurant earns points. But another another side of, of that as well is um, here in Cork, no, here in Ireland, um, we have a, a number of different charities and uh, organizations that, um, you know, uh, go feed the, you know, we say like the homeless in the society and uh, the uh, elderly in society and, um, you know, there's different uh, societies, uh, charitable organizations. But one of a, one of a, an, in, an instance of cooperation there now as well is with supermarkets, super chain, supermarket mm -hmm. chain. And there's, there's a, at least one supermarket chain that I know of anyway, um, that um, at the end of their business, they have uh, they bought their own uh, five refrigerated lorries and they take down from the shelves all the uh, fresh uh, vegetables that were, you know, up for sale that day. You know, the fr fresh foods that can go off within a couple of days. They take them down from the shelves and rather than put them in bins, or any foods that are coming to the sell by dates, rather than throw them out, they de deliver them free of charge to these different charitable organisations. So mm -hmm. if you could get if you could get in touch with the supermarket chains and ask them to become K Mama supermarkets, they'll also mm -hmm. um, gain, gain K Mama points by uh, donating so much food to different restaurants who are willing to take part in the K Mama free meal situation as well. So that's given them an extra boost of uh, free supply of food for the foods as well. Right. So you know, like came on the supermarkets as well as, you know, being supported as well. Then. So. 
So just a suggestion. That's Thanks. a great idea. That's one of the things that I've added to the list of features that we need to add is category of participants would, would be growers. So, I mean, the supermarkets would be like the grower. They're supplying the produce, the raw um, in the food that we can cook with. So then the, the people who are like the people who are creating the meals are another category. And then the people who are consuming the meals are the third category. Go ahead, Jamie. Uh, thanks, Silas. Wow, great, great stuff and great discussion. Um, so two things um, occurred to me um, is, um, and they're both related, and they both have to do with fundamentally about drawing people in more uh, into the conversation, right? And so one of those features would be like um, kind of a messaging system. So you might have, you know, a, you know a, a news item of the day or a topic of interest or an article of interest of the day that you push. You got the, you got the Kmama app, you can opt in or out of daily notifications, whatever. Obviously, the vegans are gonna opt in, they can't get enough of this, and so they'll get their daily notification. And then beneath that, imagine there's just a simple discussion forum kind of thing. You know, members who have the app, post their comments, whatever, right? Um, you post something inappropriate, you get booted out and you can never return, that kind of thing, <laughs> right? And, you know, that, so that's one. That, let's call that the text-based asynchronous, right? And then related to that could be another link that says, join the conversation, where you click on that and it takes you to a place where you see a calendar of meetings like the one we do every Friday at the block party from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., right? And say, join it, hey, join us, you know, join Dr. Silas Rao as he discusses with da 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 da, da you know, and we talk about all this. Uh, if, we, if we wanna post this meeting as well or earlier portions or whatever, we can get creative with all that. Um, so it's kind of like the join the conversation really has two ways, asynchronous text and synchronous full on Zoom video conference. Um, but right. I think because, because you're getting away from the transactional side, that really opens it up for even more classes of connections, like these social networking kind of features, et cetera. Awesome. We need to, um, I mean, we need to add that to the list of features that we have to code in the future. Um, so it's, uh, I think it, it really does open it up quite a bit once you get away from having to deal with banks and things like that, <laughs> you know? So uh, I, I think in a way it was good that uh, they, that it came back this way and they, <laughs> they told me it's so complicated. I need to double the fees, you know, for <laughs> developing this app. If, if you want to do what you really want. I said, okay, then, you know, let me think about it. And so now I'm going to tell them this. Um, yeah. Also, we've been looking at platforms uh, and um, onboarding. So Ray had, uh, Ray, you want to talk about that? The onboarding. Also, also Sh Sh Shankar's had his hand up for. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Shankar, you had your hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is a, there is a more from a surplus management. By end of the day, a lot of these restaurants, including lots of vegan restaurants or vegan friendly restaurants or even any restaurants that has vegan food, uh, they have a lot of surplus end of the day. And most of this food, it's kind of goes bad from the actual commercial point of view, but they are really not. And uh, then the one point is I heard one part of those foods are taken to the farm, animals. Mm -hmm. But some of them are can are taken to humans. But I still don't know how those logistics work. If this app can tap that surplus at the end of the day, and if it can redistribute, and and that will be a big meal. I mean, if you store it in the fridge, probably folks can eat it next day. Or uh, yeah, that, that's a good point. In fact, I remember going talking to this uh, store owner about the samosas he had, you know. I, tell, I asked him, so what do you do at the end of the day with all the leftover samosas? And he says, I toss them in the garbage. I said, my God, you know, can I come and pick them up? And he said, no, I cannot give them to you. 
because of liability issues. Well, actually, okay. there was a, if I can interject, uh, th there was a law passed, I think, in Congress some years back that basically says, listen, if you're donating food to the hungry, you're exempt from these liabilities. You know, I'm sure there's, you know, appropriate Is that right? of that. Mm -hmm. But that's the general, okay, back to you, Salish. Okay. Okay, I didn't know that. So anyway, with, with that caveat, uh, I, the other problem I have with that uh, approach is that then you don't have any control over the quality of the food you're, you're distributing to people. So it's not necessarily universal meals, so it's going to be, you know, un it could be unhealthy fried foods that they're giving away at the end of the day because that's what they had cooked, you know. So, um, yeah, go ahead. If I could tag on to that, I think I, I love Shankar's idea, but I think it's a fundamentally different animal. I am, I, 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 I um, hey, they quiet, they quiet. Sorry, I got to talk to the crows. Um, so the the, um, the in in the spirit of K Mama as a as a connection tool, right? Mm -hmm. In in precisely that spirit, um, wh where the opportunity is is the connection of those restaurants who have surplus to donate with whatever local organizations are set up to do that, right? Um, and that's a different kind of connection. It's kind of more along the lines of like a B2B, a business to business sort of connection. Right. But again, since yeah. K-Mama is in the business of making connections, this could be a different class of connections. But, it's, it, but as Silas pointed out, it's really a whole different animal. Um, anyway, happy to explore that further because I've thought about a lot, I've, I've researched that a bit. So I'm, I'm a kind of a mini subject matter expert in that for what it's worth. Anyway, right. back, back to you, Silas. And of course, if you have excess K Mama meals, you know, please feel free to donate them <laughs> at the end of the day. I mean, because that means it's already there, it's available. So, which means that we should be able to monitor that and see which cities have surplus meals available at the end of the day. That means those are the cities that are not going hungry, right? So, uh, it's a good sign if there are enough meals that are, people are offering, but there are no takers for them. Just add one point. Uh, some, sometimes if it's not for humans, it can be taken to the animals too. I, I heard a lot of folks, they take it to the farm animals and they give to the to those food. Like, right, yeah. It's another way we can consciously route to the rescue farms or sanctuaries. And... Right, right, right. But even for the animals, when we feed them our, uh, you know, fried foods, <laughs> they, they do get unhealthy too. Yeah, d yeah, definitely. Like yeah. Uh, only rest, uh, like we call out of that food, those are sorted. That is good, and uh, it's not like a, not everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's also creating like a you know, I mean, if I can tell you my experience with. Um, this is just a 10 day experience that's cooking for one family is that it created such a strong bond between us that uh, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible what it has done. You know, it's changed both our lives. It's changed their lives, it's changed my life. Um, and um, uh, I think I, I wish this upon everyone who has surplus food that they can donate. You will see the difference you make. You know, especially when you take care of someone else's hunger. So it's sort of, k -Mama is now sort of becoming that. <laughs> right? It's becoming that connection. So maybe the same people will keep ordering from the same providers every day and then they'll form a connection. Who knows where it's going to go. Yes, Jim. <laughs> okay, thanks. So um, one thing I'd like, to, I'd like for us to address at some point, and this may not be the meeting for it, maybe Friday might be better, but um, uh, is that I sort of see, you know, the K Mama app is kind of on its trajectory, and Operation Stone Soup slash Brooklyn Eats is kind of on its trajectory. And to be totally clear, 
whenever we do the press conference in Brooklyn, I would love, I want you there and I want K Mama there. And, you know, because that's what really got it, got this whole thing rolling for us. Right. So you could look at everything we're doing there as a derivative of, of K Mama. Um, but, you know, more broadly, um, I'd like for us to just have at some point a, an exploratory conversation about, you know, how do we, you know, coexist and work with each other and all that. Right. Um, how do we co-create together? How do we, you know, do we become one big thing? Do we remain as two separate things? Um, you know, and just how do we, you know, how do we play together, basically? Uh, how do we right. kind of bring it all together? Because we're taking a fundamentally different approach where we're basically saying, hey, with Brooklyn Eats, we are just, you know, we're going to feed everyone. So it's kind of like this massive logistics, you know, <laughs> airdrop, <laughs> daily airdrop, uh, so to speak. Um, and, you know, whereas the K Mama app is, is, a, is, is a bit of a different trajectory, right? Which starts with connecting, you know, just making these connections and all that, which is super cool. So I see lots of great areas for synergy. I just wanted it to be something that we address explicitly at some point. But anyway, back to you. I just wanted to put that in your in your hopper. Yeah, let me uh, ask you, did you, have you connected with Eric Adams in Brooklyn? Uh, no, I haven't heard of him. Eric Adams. Eric Adams. Yeah, please uh, note that name down. Eric Adams. He's a, uh, he's running for mayor of New York City. So, and he's from Brooklyn. Oh, wait, is, 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 is he the current borough president? Yeah. Oh, okay. So he's former police officer, African-American, vegan, right. wrote a book on V. Okay, yeah, no, no, no. We, we, we know all about him. I hadn't made the connection with the name, but Jackie, okay, in fact, okay, right. the, 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 the reason we, one of the reasons we chose Brooklyn was because of him, actually. Okay. Um, right, so good. anyway, no, no, no. So we, we, we've, we've basically been just kind of figuring out our own internals, so to speak, but of course, in the very public way that we're doing it, um, prior to then reaching out to his office formally and saying, hey, you know, this is what we want to do. Also, we're, we're building out some other Brooklyn connect, you know, because if we, if we knock on his door and it's like, oh, great, you know, what part of Brooklyn are you from? Well, actually, none of us are from Brooklyn, right? That, that would be less, far less impactful than having a bunch of Brooklynites and Brooklyn organizations already working with us. And then we go together. Anyway, um, right. yeah, but thank you. Thank you. Super cool. No, that's, you know, that, that's part of the reason we're doing Brooklyn. But the other part is that, um, as Extinction Rebellion has pointed out, it's very important to go to the capital city. And since this is a planetary thing, we're going to the capital city of the world, which is New York City. It's also the news media capital of the world. So it's, it's mm -hmm. perfect for a whole bunch of reasons. Right. Mm -hmm. See, but the way K-Mama envisions this happening, it's not as a centralized, large uh, distribution of food but rather a, a decentralized distribution of food through uh, existing commercial uh, restaurants and places like that. So let's say, you know, a restaurant says, um, I have received 40 orders for this for lunch and therefore I'm gonna have 40 meals available, okay? So you could imagine them, you know, saying that 20 of those meals are called for, I mean, are, have been spoken for because someone ordered them on the app, but the other 20 meals, anything extra, we're going to leave it out. For anyone who wants food, it's available at 12 o'clock. So we could have some kind of a process put in place outside these um, eating establishments where people know they're going to get good free food available every day at noon and at 7 o'clock, whatever. Oh, it's five o'clock. So, so twice a day, they will get good free food available. And this then uses the existing supply chains where, because the restaurant is buying their own way. You know, they are ordering from producers the way they always order produce. So it just ensures that you're using the existing supply chains to, to just take that ex excess food that's being grown and bring it into the city and use it for creating free food. Uh, that's the goal, okay? Because to me, the, I mean, I, I, I was motivated by the, uh, to do this because uh, I read somewhere that a whole mountain of potatoes was being trashed or a whole bunch of lettuce was being trashed because restaurants were not buying them. 
I mean, their normal supply chains were not working anymore. And simultaneously, I hear all these people going hungry. I said, you know, as a species, this is one of the stupidest things you could be doing. Your fellow species, fellow members are going hungry and others are dumping the food in the ground. Right? I mean, no other species would ever allow this to happen. Every other species will say, there's food over there, go get it. Right? They would go eat it. <laughs> because they don't have to depend on pieces of paper with pictures of dead presidents on them to actually move the food from where they are to where it needs to be eaten. <laughs> you, need pictures so, of, you need pictures of dead presidents to buy dead animals <laughs> in this country. Right. So, so this way, you know, I, I wanted to do something that would just, just <laughs> use the same supply chains that were already there in order to get this going. Okay? So, uh, of course, that's just my engineering, <laughs> my engineering sense coming through and saying, you know, this is what I would do you know, if I were an engineer and asked to do something like this. Go ahead, Jamie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and that, makes, that makes total sense. You know, really, there's fundamentally two ways to approach um, this bridging of food to the people who need the food. Um, you know, one is through revitalizing the existing supply chain, but another way of, look, of looking at it, here's how I've been describing it lately. Um, Salish, I'm going to ask you to mute your mic if you'd be good enough, because that's, again, a little feedback there. Um, but another way, here, here's, here's the metaphor I'm using. Take a house of cards, right? Before it was, it was stressed here and there, crumbling here and there. Now with the pandemic, it's like a gust of wind has come and just lifted the whole house of cards up in the air. Everything is end over end, twittering, twattering. And we could either say, wait, quick, quick, quick. Let's try to put these pieces of the, of the house of cards back in, this, in the order they were before so that we can get this cycle going. Another way is saying, all right, take a deep breath. We've got an opportunity here to take a clean slate and take this whole set of cards and configure it potentially in a whole different way. And you know, my my thinking around that is that because not only are current food networks compromised, broken, breaking, whatever state they're in, the whole financial system is broken, breaking, right? So that you know, people no longer have the means of generating income. And so only the rich really have money to buy food now. So um, what we're thinking, our thinking, um, speaking for you know, the Operation Stone Soup community, emergent community, is let's completely redesign the whole of it holistically, right? And the strategy that we're taking um, is, uh, if I were to describe it in military terms, let's first take the top of the hill with with rifles and then bring in heavy artillery to really secure it and then radically change the course of the war and in in this case what i'm talking about is we first come in you know <laughs> guns a blazing so to speak uh just delivering food to whole neighborhoods at a time proclaiming what we're doing to the world in an extremely public way as we've talked about and inviting the world to fall in love with it and join us and join the process, join the movement, join the collective intelligence. And that's where over time, we bring in the heavy artillery of whatever the, the new redesign of the food networks is. Because at first we're starting totally so stone soup style. We don't have a single ingredient, right? Other than commitment, which is represented by the stone, right? And so we come and show our commitment, others will fall in love with it and show their commitment. and then the collective intelligence will figure out the real how, right? Um, I've got some vague ideas as to how it could be done. Um, but, you know, uh, um, and that's because, look, I, you know, I've got, I've, I mean, my ideas go all the way to an extreme of just a pure gift economy, right? Where the farmers basically say, listen, take my land, I, you know, organize the volunteers, have them come and do the planting and all that, just use my land for this benevolent purpose and let all the food be donated. And then volunteers donate their time, oil companies donate the fuel, you know, local mechanics donate the 
vehicle maintenance services um, to keep the fleets running. Bicycle shops donate the bicycle maintenance services so that the bicycle fleets can deliver food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it just be, I mean, but you know, how do you actually operationalize that? There's a gap between a press conference and this utopian, you know, new food network. I totally get that, that there's a, a giant chasm there. But my belief and my faith is that by starting the process stone soup style, like the three soldiers saying, listen, we're going to feed the whole town. Subtext, we don't know how, but we're going to do it. And but by making the commitment and doing the spectacle, for lack of a better word, that's I don't like that word, but it's what came to mind by doing this big public press conference and inviting the world into the conversation. Um, it immediately creates a story where there will be immediately controversy because you're going to have some holdouts who say what, what feeding everyone that's communism. Right. And that's going to activate certain people. Um, because all the rich people have one thing in common around the world. Uh, they haven't donated <laughs> their money to ending hunger, otherwise they, they wouldn't be rich. Um, and so they all have reasons for not donating. Um, and I've, I've, I've heard them time and again to the point that, um, anyway, it, it, it's just, they're just lost in their thinking because they're addicted to hoarding. Um, this turns it on its head. And in so doing, it challenges their old thinking and I think we'll get gobs of donations. I, I have so much faith in that. I think this is just going to become the most popular thing on earth. And I think that the way to launch it is stone soup style, big press conference style, and admittedly not having all the answers. And, and essentially that being, the, that being the case for join the conversation, join the collective intelligence. We don't have all the answers, but you do. So join us and then we'll together we'll, we'll, we'll get it all sorted out. <laughs> anyway, that's that in, in sort of a nutshell, and Jackie, please add anything you'd like to add or anyone, um, James, uh, Emery, we, we've, been, we've been going at this for dozens of hours <laughs> in the last week and really on fire with it. Thank you. Yeah, um, in, in the white paper, I mean, that's where we want to end up in. So I talk about contributionism versus capitalism. And um, so, so it's switching to contributionism from where we are now, right? Capitalism that we are in now. Uh, but the Aquarius game is framed as a way to transition from capitalism to contributionism. So it, it's sort of, I'm looking at the transition pathway uh, so, uh, so that you're not disrupting existing supply chains, but you're starting with them and then you're adding to the supply chain. So, you know, like local growers, urban growers, those can all be part of Kemama. So they then say, you know, I have, I'm making, you know, lettuce in my, in my apartment complex. I can give it to you. So they start contributing to that. And then people just buy, take from them for free. So everything in Kemama will be free, right? Take from them, take their excess produce and use it to make their food. So. Um, but that's just a, you know, it's, it's the how of it, as opposed to, um, uh, the vision is the same. I want to get to exactly where you are, you know, exactly the same commitment to ending hunger, you know, it's, just, it's the same uh, idea of a gift economy, it's exactly the same. Uh, uh, people do feel, everyone feels they belong, you know, and there is no one being left out. So uh, food is available for everyone. You know, it's an idea of an abundant planet, right? So rather than continuing along the current path, which is going to end in disaster for everyone, it's how do you how do you make this this transition to um, to get to where you need to go? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so two points on that, both centered around um, how to make the transition. And the, 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 first, the first thing I want to say is um, that we're, we're not at all opposed to upcycling and, re, you know, using the existing supply chains, including restaurants, including produce distributors, including farmers and all that. So, for example, when uh, the first billionaire in Manhattan writes a billion, multi-billionaire in Manhattan writes a multi, multi, writes a billion dollar check to us to donate, 
and wins the uh, Compassionate Billionaire Award for 2020, um, that billion dollars will very likely go straight to restaurants that basically says, look, you've shown that, you know, you're working with K-Mama, et cetera, you're, you're able to produce, deliver efficiently, um, you know, what do I need to do to buy all your capacity? Well, shoot, if you give me, you know, 150 grand a month, you, well, we can max out and deliver all that food. And, you know, we'll, we'll be open book with you and we'll just pay ourselves salaries and pay the electricity company their due and pay Hobart its due for maintaining the ovens. And, you know, we're good to go. Great. Uh, now we got to wait. Uh, that, that would be how I would deploy the billion just immediately, just, just, you know, with those kind of deals. So, th so there's, so we're, we're all about that. It's not like we're just trying to, you know, destroy everything, you know, Luddite style and, and start with a scorched earth clean slate. No, we, we want to work with existing food systems and add to them. No, we're, we're really talking about the same thing. So where I think that for me, where, where the main difference um, comes is in we're taking a very media friendly, media heavy approach and doing a singular, single public event at a singular location and stacking that press conference like you saw we did with President Vicente Fox, stacking it with all the experts, big guns across the board. Dr. Priya Nike, oh my goodness, her and her team, whew, that's like the jewel in the crown, you know. And then, you know, we'll bring in local Brooklyn organizations from food banks to churches to, you know, to you name it, to community garden leaders and all that, and just make this just a Brooklyn wide feel good thing. That will be such a news item that we are committing to feeding everyone in Brooklyn. That is a story. And we will get President Vicente Fox caliber leaders, you know, like the, like the, the, the borough president, uh, Eric Adams, who was Jackie's original inspiration for Brooklyn, right? So we will stack the deck. It will be a hard hitting, welcome Melvin. Melvin brother, welcome back. It will be a hard hitting, heavy caliber, you know, Oakland A's 1989 lineup. Remember when they just kept winning ser series after series with Jose Canseco, et cetera. Anyway, it'll be a lineup like that where every batter is a heavy hitter and um, it will just, you know, this is my world. I, I, you know, I was, I was trained as an engineer, just like you, Silas. But then, you know, through my work, you know, I just went off on a different path in, into marketing, deep into marketing, where I had to master it and did and ended up loving it. I used to think of it as a necessary evil. But anyway, I've become this master marketer and the proof's in the pudding. I've, you know, I've done big things that have changed the course of history. And this is another opportunity to, to use those skills in exactly that way. This is the story the world is waiting for, because the world is waiting for a story that says you're going to be okay. And guess what? We have the solution to the world's problems. We're not going to say it that way, but that's going to be the message, overt or, or subconscious or whatever, that will get through, that we have the solution. And it's, it starts with feeding everyone and changing the world's agriculture and diets and everything else because the, the meat part has to go. And to do that, the, the food networks, by definition, are just going to radically transform. And we're going to have so much surplus capacity of producing real food, right, that we simply change the economics, we change the dynamics. And think of food now as becoming like a public service, just like water, you know, um, uh, electricity, uh, garbage, sanitation, police, protection, fire department protection, et cetera, um, food can become a public service. So everything is changing so radically right now anyway. It's just the perfect moment for it that I see. But the way that we get to them is we just say, listen, we're feeding everyone. And we're working with local restaurants. And we're working with local, we're working, working, working with all these local players. We're not excluding anyone, heaven forbid. We want everyone to play. Um, we're just taking we're just we've got a whole new paradigm now which is feed everyone right and uh whole food plant-based immune boosting so they can stay home deliver to their homes so you got a very tiny percentage of the population with hazmat suits you know delivering food to everyone super clean versus half the population having to leave their home every couple of days to get food right and therefore spreading the spreading the virus so um anyway it, it it's uh you know, but I also think it's a beautiful thing that 
each that many groups pursue many different solutions, right? You know, day to day, I may be focused on a press conference, you may be focused on an app, but when press when when showtime comes, we're together, right? And so, you know, it's 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 a healthy thing that, you know, these are separate projects. Um, if there's a way to totally integrate them, I am so 100% on board. But uh, you know, I don't want to push that on anyone. Um, I'm just I'm just here. <laughs> you know, I'm just here uh, doing doing my part and helping us all do our part. Yes, Jackie. Um, so I've been in and out of the meeting. I'm I'm sorry about that. And so I remember Aquarius being um, mentioned. Is that is that something that we're going to explore? Because when I've been discussing um, this initiative and this project with people and inviting them to the collective intelligence to um, contribute to this solution, that always comes up. It's like, okay, I know you're saying for free, but then you know there's people that need to make money. You know what is the solution in between? And I I don't have the language to communicate that. So is is this something that we can discuss? Um, you know, on the block party, like the Aquarius, like that transition that Silesh is talking about, so that because I, I I don't have that language of technology and all that, I I don't know how to respond to that. About right, it. right, right. I mean, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just a question that keeps coming up about like, well, what about the the, the gardeners, and what about the farmers? They need to, and so I don't know how to marry. I don't know how to bridge those those two topics together to transition and how we're going to do it and how we're going to fund ourselves and, and all that. Right. So the whole idea behind Aquarius is uh, Aquarius is a game that can be played in the current system as a game. So it's so meaning you are doing exactly what you were doing before, except you're also simultaneously playing Aquarius. Okay. And when we do that, um, it uh, automatically changes our consumer behavior. Just like it changed, uh, going vegan changed the infrastructure around people supplying food, because they, now they have to figure out how to give us vegan food. Not only vegan food, they had to give us vegan clothing, vegan shoes. I mean, we changed, we have changed the industry quite a bit by going vegan, right? In the same way, when in addition to going vegan, if you play Aquarius, you start shrinking the existing infrastructure to address what we need, which is you know, a low impact products, low impact packaging. All of that will be demanded through the Aquarius system. So, but to do that, you know, it's not just writing the Aquarius app, you also have to write the Aquarius database with all of the, um, the uh, energy footprint, the land use footprint and the CO2 footprint for every product, every uh, vegan product has to be calculated and put in the database, okay? Now, this is something that we have to do anyway because I cannot imagine a future in which we don't measure any of this, okay? <laughs> if you don't measure it, you're going to break it. That's one of the first rules of engineering. So you're gonna break it and you're gonna violate it and you're going to just destroy the rest of life when you're doing it. This is what we have been doing so far because we are not measuring that. We are measuring just a, um, price based on, on uh, supply and demand, okay? Which is, which is an entirely different game. So I'm saying, okay, if you play the Aquarius game in addition to the money game, then we change the capitalist system, okay? We make them change the infrastructure to what they need to serve us. And then uh, eventually we will only play the Aquarius game. We don't have to play the other game. So Aquarius becomes the currency, so to speak. It's not a currency anymore. It is just a, an accounting mechanism for humanity, right? And, uh, and then in the Aquarius, everyone begins knowing that they're treated fairly, that they all belong, everyone belongs. So it's a different paradigm. Whereas in the current system, you don't belong unless you have this money in your account. How long before we'd be able to spend Aquarius. No. And how Aquarius does is, spending it look? There is no spending whatsoever in Aquarius. Aquarius is about, you know, you get this, you get this flow coming into your account. And then when you scan a device, I mean, you scan a product and you say, I want to purchase that product, it subtracts it from your account. 
or it tells you you don't have enough in your account to buy this product please think about it okay now you can choose to say ignore it and say i will still buy it anyway but you're paying dollars to buy that right um, but it tells you what is allowed within the aquarius framework so you get an idea of you know what kind of lifestyle you'll be leading in the future if you were to just have the aquarius game and that will give you an idea whether uh, you want to support that or not or what we need to do to make it more attractive right see ultimately uh, in the current game you're depending on creating uh, scarcities without scarcities the current game has no value for any product right so if you have plenty of clean water plenty of pure water no one is going to buy your bottled water so to sell bottled water you have to first pollute the water and create an artificial scarcity of pure water that's the kind of game we've been playing so far that's the game of capitalism and this is why it's unsustainable whereas in the aquarius game you are assuming abundance and you're saying there's plenty for all of us and now live according to that and you will see whether it's true or not right so um you said that it would eventually become the currency do we have to wait for our current money to fail before it becomes the case or is it is there at some point we start to have actual trade as part of this game i yeah, understand yeah, yeah. it starts as right. a as kind of a one way thing but right eventually there'll be trade so i'm thinking of trade where uh you say i have you know i have too much co2 footprint available towards co2 footprint allowance but i need some energy footprint allowance so then you trade your co2 footprint for energy footprint in a market okay and get the, get your extra co2 footprint so that you can buy this product that has a lot of co2 footprint so there is a, it's a multi dimensional cost uh, paradigm that we put in place and a multi dimensional you know because this is what kate rawat this uh, donut economy is about there is it's a multi dimensional limit so and so there is a minimum for everyone and then there is a maximum that you can go to so the aquarius would probably be somewhere in the middle is the way i would design it yeah. go ahead melvin and then jamie yeah um <laughs> I'm all on the board with Aquarius um, and I like the narrative as you were saying in the seven core shift to make this here a uh, global change that we want to make. We have to change the money system. Mm -hmm. But what Jackie was saying right now for people like, you know, like myself, if I don't go out and make some money, mm -hmm. you know how can i do the aquarius right now how can i do aquarius right now you know in 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 what we want to do like i'm volunteering at this here garden mm -hmm. and the garden needs money over there so we still have to to be in the current system you know so how do people like myself you know and people who want to change what can we say to them to transition over to to the aquarius system when right now you have to pay rent you have to get your car fixed you got to buy groceries you got to do everything right. right yeah now uh good question melvin because so uh initially there'll be very few people playing the aquarius game so uh over time as more and more people play the game there will be exchanges within the aquarius network that could be free services because it's an entirely gift economy right the aquarius economy is entirely gift economy so maybe someone will say you know i can give you the pot for growing your food or i can repair your car because you're an aquarius member right and i won't charge you but if he has to go buy some nuts and bolts you know to fix your car there is cost that he has to go and pay the current capitalist system right so uh so there so there is this transition that's happening okay 
Now you can play the Aquarius game even now, if the database is available and the game is available, you can play it now and you will be easily meeting your requirements if you don't have too much money. <laughs> right? Because you're not, you're not buying anything. You're not buying much. So Aquarius is a way to limit our discretionary spending to, uh, to products that have a lot of ecological uh, impact. So to limiting it so that you don't exceed the limits, right? And uh, the idea is that it, it is mainly for those who have a lot to understand what does it mean to live in the Aquarius economy and, and then start supporting it. Okay. Simultaneously, it's also for those who have very little to see that there is more that they are entitled to that they could be getting if they weren't shackled in the current capitalist system. Okay. So it tells them, hey, I, you know, I need more, right? So it makes them go and demand from the people who are in the current capitalist system to give up some of their so-called riches right? and to join the Aquarius system. So that is the idea that you're creating both a push and a pull to the Aquarius system. Okay. But uh, all I'm saying is eventually we have to get to the Aquarius system, where or a system in which we are actually measuring our, our ecological footprint, not just in land use, but also in CO2 use, in energy use, and you know, making sure that we are within our means you know, uh, on, human, uh, on planet Earth, because we have a finite planet. Okay. And um, uh, from an engineering perspective, I don't see any way out of doing that. We are never going to have a free for all, you know, in that sense. Until we are all awakened and we automatically reduce our consumption. That's the way of life. Then maybe you don't have to measure anymore. I don't know, right? <laughs> uh, so, but uh, right now, if I were to talk about how do we transition, I would say we need to measure. All right. So that's what Adam was, Adam Soul is talking about, a world without any money. We don't need to measure anything. Right? Everyone is just doing things for others as a gift. Um, but then, you know, are we mining for iron? Are we mining for nickel? You know, and who says you can mine for nickel? Who, so that's where the question comes. You know, I, I, how much can we mine for nickel? How much can we mine for iron? Because we're using all that in our, uh, in our technologies, right? So that's where the question comes and that's where we need to have some kind of a limit. Anyway, Jamin, sorry. No, 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 thanks, Alex. What a wonderful conversation. So I wanted to offer yet another way in which we can work together uh, in terms of what we're gonna launch in New York and uh, specifically the Aquarius currency, which is, um, I think the Aquarius, Aquarius currency, currency could be a really great way of uh, essentially logging and memorializing um, in a way with, that has integrity uh, contributions that people make. Let's say there's a volunteer bicyclist who's got a trailer and he's out there you know, making deliveries. Fine, jink, 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 racking up Aquarius points. If you're a farmer and you donate produce that otherwise would have gone to waste, jink, 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 Aquarius points, life-giving resources. And um, so I think that could just be a really great way to, to help launch um, Aquarius because everyone wants to be generous. And you know what? If you make it so that that generosity is well-received and appreciated and thank you and, you know, then it's all the better right? Everyone loves a thank you. And uh, so this would make it kind of systematic and also in a way sort of public. Uh, some people want that public recognition, others don't. Fine, let's consider both scenarios. Um, another point I wanted to make is that, you know, <clears throat> this gets back to Operation Stone Soup, which is not just about the food. Food is the launching point, but then stages two and three of the rocket ship ride are collective superintelligence and then cooling the planet via SRM applying the collective superintelligence, which evolved and evolved and evolved over the course of feeding everyone, right? Which, what a great environment for the evolution of this new planetary brain, 
than by involving everyone and feeding everyone. Um, Steven Weisberg calls that plugging in the computer, right, of collective superintelligence, because we're now powering everyone, you know, with compassion, compassionate nutrition, right, and therefore freeing us all up to spend time on Zoom video conferences as opposed to rummaging around looking for, right. for, for food. Anyway, um, so just wanted to throw that in that it's, and then, but of course from, and then beyond SRM, it's all the other solutions that we can address with collective superintelligence. So it's, it's really a holistic, totally holistic, hitting all these major check boxes and, all the, and then all the medium size and small check boxes that follow. Anyway, that's, been a, that's quite a mouthful. I'll pass it on to you. Thanks, Silas. Shankar. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm thinking the Kimaya app as uh, or Kimama, uh, sorry, Kimama, right? So, uh, is it, is, it will, will there be any point that within the points will get scarce or how it replenishes? Uh, what are the, what are the primary things replenishes the points? Yeah. Yeah. So, the way uh, it's been coded right now is that everyone who joins the app uh, gets, I think, two points every day. Uh, for just being in the app. And then every time they order uh, a meal, they get two points. I mean, they get one point for every meal they order. And every time they offer a meal, they get one point as well. So it's basically collecting. Uh, there is no subtraction whatsoever in the app. It's all addition. Okay? It's all accumulation. And the idea is you're building reputation within the app. You're building a reputation for yourself as someone who has consumed a lot of whole food plant-based meals or someone who has supplied a lot of whole food plant-based meals, okay? Or someone who has participated for a long time, okay? So it also measures longevity that you've stayed in the app, that you haven't said, you know, unsubscribe and get out of the app. <laughs> then you lose all those points. And so the idea is that uh, then we can tell people, if you have over, you know, 500 points, 500 Karuna points, then you're welcome to join Aquarius. So it becomes an on-ramp for Aquarius. So you're sort of building a reputation within Kmama and then it becomes an on-ramp. Then you know that this is a real person who's actually been eating good vegan food or who's been participating in this, um, in this app. And so therefore, he's welcome. They're welcome to join Aquarius, right? Otherwise, Aquarius can be misused, right? And uh, also within Aquarius, we want to, initially it will be just an accounting mechanism, but we also want to then have what Jamin was talking about, which is, you know, I feel good about what you did to me, so I'm gonna donate two Aquarius points to you, you know? So it's like you are sort of giving your generosity, expressing your generosity by giving people Aquarius points because you are continuously getting Aquarius points all the time, okay? Aquarius again is a is a it's like a flow. It's a flow of money that comes from the bottom up. So it's it's a, you are the source of all money on the planet. Every individual is a source of all money on the planet. No other money is created. Okay? No other Aquarius points are created except through individuals. And and then from the individuals it goes up. So it's a hierarchy that's built up in the bottom. So I imagine that a community has exactly the same architecture for the Aquarius account as an individual, except it's getting all of the input from all the individuals in the community, right? And so some of it goes automatically into its pocket that it can use without having to do anything. And the other goes as tax to the community above it, you know, which could be a city or a nation, whatever. So you can build hierarchies up the level. And eventually there'll be one Aquarius account for the planet. That could be like the UN's account, right? So this is how you account for everyone's footprint and you allow for um, ecological footprint allowance for, um, for community projects, like maintaining roads or things like that. Yeah, it's a good, uh, good. Uh, I'm, I'm able to visualize through Salish. So it is like I can totally take the economy. Uh, I'm just using that as a 
or it's like I'm just using the roads already laid. So <clears throat> just as a channel, like uh, not the exploitation, everything, just the channels. So this can be exactly each and every industry, every establishment, every office, every catering, and every, everywhere I can apply, almost apply. Like, so the points, like there will be a compassionate points accumulated for everything. Like every, like everyone has their bank balance as an entity or as an individual. So uh, as a state or as a nation, we will all have these points accumulated at, uh, and, and rolled up, rolled up, rolled up, which is always there for common consumption. So that is, that if my understanding is, correct me please, that's the that's answer. And one more, one more thing I was also saying, like just to accelerate the pace in the, from a vegan world, we think the animal rescue, all those will also get points or just the, uh, like for example, if I rescue a, a, a cow that is going to slaughterhouse, if I put it in a sanctuary and that cow mm -hmm has a good life, then uh, will that be also considered as a point or, or it will be more to th thought through in the future? Or... Uh, the way we were, um, the way I had been talking about this is that organizations like that, those who rescue animals, those who are doing cooperative work, so we give them a special um, uh, power to to increase the flow of Aquarius to the pocket of the individual, right? So, so this way, an individual goes and does an act of compassion in that organization, they get more flow into their account, okay? So, so they get a benefit for that. And so some of that goes into the, rather into the community, it goes into the organization's box account as well. So this way, the organization that is, doing the compassionate work gets some allowance from the individual automatically. Yeah. So, so this way you're encouraging acts of compassion in the Aquarius system. So these are certified compassionate organizations, we call them. And so every, uh, every um, enterprise will be a cooperative in Aquarius that is also certified compassion. So every corporation will be certified compassion. Okay. So they have to be just like uh, Tofurki, you know, they have to be doing things like Tofurki does. Uh, and because in the new system, no one, I mean, you cannot get people to come and work for you unless they want to work for you. They want to work in this organization. This is their contribution. So this is rather than capitalism, I call it contributionism. So everyone is trying to figure out how to contribute to the community, right? How, what is their gift? Or maybe you can call it giftivism instead of capitalism. So um, that's basically the idea. That's how you create economic activity. So ultimately economy is about how do, how do we get people to act, to work for a common good? Yeah, just have one, one follow up on that. Yeah. So, does it, uh, from the food angle, like if I'm buying a food for my friend, so will, will that also get accounted or if it is, yeah. it is like, I have to ask him to go in, at the initial phase, like initial when we are starting things simple towards the launch. So I have to tell him like, no, the food bank is where you approach or the, <laughs> how does it? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks, Jamin. I know. I got it from you. See, everything that I, I'm saying is, is the accumulation of people, of things I heard from people. So, yeah. So the way that would work, uh, Shankar, is uh, you go buy, say, let's say you, you go buy for someone, and you can then say, I have, I'm a, I have four meals available today. Okay, on the KMAMA app. You say, I have four meals available. And someone contacts you saying, hey, I want those four meals. And you tell them, you know, I've already ordered it. It's there in this restaurant. Okay. I already paid for it. So you get the points for offering those four meals. Okay. And then the restaurant gets those points if they are also part of the K-Mama. Right. <laughs> they can say, I want to offer an extra four meals, whatever, eight meals. Then they get those points. So you are the one who bought those meals. 
So you get those points, and then the restaurant gets points for offering those meals. To you. Or you can say, I want to cook me four meals. This is what I'm cooking. This is the particular recipe. I want to give that away. Yeah, thank you, sir. Amazing. Yeah. So this is how you build reputation within uh, Kmama, and then the so the idea is, you know, once you once you have built enough reputation, then you're welcome to join Aquarius. So I mean, of course, Aquarius has to be written. I mean, we are uh, with. Uh, this is why I want to get this app done so that I can use this source code to teach myself <laughs> how to write Aquarius because it's a. I mean, I used to write software before. Okay, it's not something new I'm doing, but uh, that's 20 years ago. So <laughs> things have changed. So, I, so I'm listening to these kids, you know, they're talking in their own lingo and I'm saying, okay, show me what you've done. And then I think I can copy you. <laughs> so Alex, how much does, uh, um, after we, we get this uh, currency that we can, you know, spend, it, how much does it bear resemblance to the Ahimsa coin that you've described in your book? It's the same idea, except that I've added more structure to it. I've added a little bit more details to it. It's the same idea. Uh, the idea is, uh, is, is that we have to measure our ecological footprint, whether it is land use or CO2 or energy or, or gold use, whatever it is. You know, There are all these limited resources that we have to um, we have to be careful about spending it, you know, because our children depend on us leaving a planet that's thriving. So whatever needs to be measured and uh, limited has to be in the Aquarius as one of the dimensions of Aquarius or Ahimsa coin. So, and I suppose one of the, the answers for when people go, this, this sounds kind of communist, this sounds very socialist, taking care of everybody, it is a form of capitalism, right? By, by definition, by its structure, it's a capitalism that's constrained to our carbon footprint or ecological footprint. Yeah, the capital is the earth, already there, okay? So it's like we are, so this is like a caretaker version of capitalism, so as opposed to a exploitative version of capitalism. So right now we have a capitalism in which everything is commodified, right? Um, not only the earth is commodified, earth becomes property, uh, animals become exploitable, and people who don't look like us become exploitable, right? And capitalism is all about profit making. So how do I accumulate more for me? And um, because I have to return the loan I borrowed, because all money is borrowed in capitalism, right? All money is borrowed. And because it's all borrowed, I have to return it. How do I return it? They say, well, you can exploit that. <laughs> and so using that, you can make money and then return it, right? So that's the game we are playing. And so that game itself, there are people who are playing roles in that game and who are forced to play those roles because they have no other, you know, they don't know, they just happen to get into that role, right? So. That's the game of monopoly and um, that's driving this destruction of the planet. So what we are saying is that is part of the growth phase. So that's the caterpillar phase. And that was okay during that time, but now we have to shift um, and we have to shift to another game. And in this game, instead of capitalism, it will be giftivism or contributionism. So people, uh, people feel abundant, that they belong in a world of abundance. They belong, they belong, first of all, period right? Where there is no ownership of property. There's no ownership of the earth. It's about caretaking of the earth. It's a different mindset altogether. You don't own anything. Because as soon as you own something and you put a fence around it, you're back to capitalism the other way, right? And, um, and instead of uh, exploiting animals and exploiting people, it's you're taking care of animals. You're you know, showing respect to animals. You're being kind to animals. So it's, so it's a different role. This is why I say it's an entirely different species. So you're going from Homo sapiens sapiens to Homo, Homo ahimsa. And it's a different mindset. This is going from caterpillar to butterfly. 
And this is the time in which we are in the chrysalis phase where we have to think about all these systems that we have to build for the butterfly. This is the transition phase. This is why I'm trying to figure out a game that I can play along with the old game. So it's both the games together becomes the transition game. And then when you get to the butterfly, there's only one game again. It's the Aquarius game. That's a game that changes as time goes on. It has to be adaptable. How, uh, what are the sort of things that you need to see happen before it uh, uh, gets to replace the current system? Like, how does it change if we had a universal basic income? Yeah, it's closer. It's, it's, yeah, this is, this is the universal basic income. This is the Aquarius is the universal basic allowance everyone gets. Uh, but it's not basic. It's actually universal abundant allowance, right? That's what I hope to be. Um, because once we start um, thinking, of, thinking in this new mindset, you're no longer artificially creating scarcity. Okay. You're actually working to clean the rivers. You're working to clean the ocean. So... So in that sense, you're creating abundance. As you create abundance, your Aquarius becomes worth more and more and more. Your allowance becomes worth more and more and more, right? But you're not using as much. So eventually people will stop even measuring that. You're automatically within limits, right? So that's what I expect when everyone becomes like a Buddha. <laughs> everyone has come home to who they really are. which just fundamentally compassionate. Fundamentally, not looking for happiness outside. You know, you're already happy within. Uh, you, have, you have this contentment within you. So when you do that, then you're not looking for, you know, how do I go from here to there in two seconds? Right? And using up all my footprint for that. I have so many more questions, but I see James on the list. There. Yes. Oh, J J uh, thank, thank you, Ray. And uh, J James also has his hand up. Go, go ahead, James. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I just think it's a great idea, um, Silas, and it, it can expand in so many ways, really, when you think about it, like, because uh, it, it, like, we are coming to a different age, a different, um, like, the new norm is, it, like, the old norm is gone, like, and we have to think about new ways, and part of that is, uh, you know, re the, the disposable age is one of the ages that has to disappear anyway, the disposable age all these products that are being produced and just disposed of at, at, at willy-nilly like, and end up uh, polluting the environment and destroying and killing the, the life and the sea, all this kind of stuff. So the, the disposable age is one of the main things that has to be gotten rid of. So we have to, like the encouragement of uh, recyclable products and uh, longer lasting products now has to take over and be encouraged rather than disposable products. So these home the points can be awarded to companies like as you said like how much uh, iron and gold and uh, nickel is uh, mined to produce all these constant different mobile phones which is upgraded new phone every year for what because it has a better camera in it because if you sometimes think about but that's about the, as much as as the hype as they give you at the end of the year like about the new model of the phone all it has really is a better camera or something, right. an XR, or you know. So it's a waste of waste of um, resources. So these products could be these product uh, makers could be earning points by um, no longer making disposable products, but making longer lasting products. And I know that's contrary to our uh, country to for them making product pro, uh, profit, but they could be encouraged to make profit by if they can build a design a product that will last much much longer into the future that can be used then for like like a mobile phone or computers or anything else they're they're constantly upgraded from source you know what i mean from downloads so the the actual product itself should last for years but the downloads can be up installed but the more downloads that are installed the the product maker gets a certain percentage of the profit from the down you know the products that are downloaded or the businesses that are using the product itself a minute profit of theirs goes to the producer of the product so that they're still making uh, earning from that product into the future and not constantly destroying resources and things like that. Like, but anyway, it's another way of adding points to different companies and resources. Great idea. I mean, great point, James. In fact, that's the idea behind this is, is to, uh, if you make 
products that last a long time, then your Aquarius footprint drops. So the actual cost in Aquarius will be dropping, right? Because you are guaranteeing it for 10 years as opposed to five years. So you are now taking the footprint that you used and dividing it over 10 years as opposed to five years, right? So, the, so then people are, um, so the, uh, the intent is to encourage such designs as opposed to designs that you switch out every year, or switch out every six months because you're no longer doing things for profit you're doing things because that's your contribution to the community, right? So these cooperatives that are the new Apple or the new Google, people are working there because that's what they want to contribute to the larger community. And, and so they're all volunteers. So essentially it is taking all our open source, uh, uh, open source infrastructure and making that the normal. Uh, that would be the normal thing. And um, yeah, we need to get there, right? Because right now, you know, unless Apple is selling more and more apples every year, their stock will go down. So this is why they're incentivized to make sure that the, the battery is, cannot be changed out by the customer. And so they have to junk it as soon as the battery dies. So, so they have to then go get another apple or it'll cost you so much more to change the battery than to just buy another apple. So that's the kind of model they're using now. So, um, and that clearly wastes a lot of resources. I think in future there will be a, an entire profession devoted to mining landfills. You know, I mean, how do you mine landfills and uh, clean up, not only clean up, but extract resources back. So there is, the, you know, anytime we manufacture the things, we are increasing the entropy of the product. So it's making it more and more complex. So it's hard to get back the original raw material, but some of them can be recovered, right? Like cars, you can recover all the iron and the steel that you put in. So they have a fairly good uh, recovery rate for the metal that went into the car. Go ahead, Ray. Oh, actually, I was, I, I was. Uh, oh, sorry, you were. Yeah, you were next. Sorry, uh, you're right. Yeah, and then right. Okay, thank, thanks, thanks, Alice. Um, so, re regard. First of all, regarding certified compassionate and exactly what we were just talking about, um, I'll just share a little bit more about this. So that part about you know disposable phones versus phones where you simply replace the battery. Um, that would fall under, so to be certified compassionate, and by the way, this is a real thing. We, we've got this trademarked for the full spectrum of products and services through the US Patent and Trademark Office. And we also have a corresponding membership mark for member, uh, for compassionate uh, organizations. Um, and uh, that's called Compassionate Economy. That's the membership organization. So you become a member of Compassionate Economy and then you get certified. Um, and so to be certified, it's a, it's a very high bar. All your profits must go to eradicating hunger. You must be socially transformational in everything you do. And you must be ecologically regenerative. Well, to be ecologically regenerative, you have to build a phone that'll last for a decade, right? And, you know, swap out the battery and even make the battery, you know, easily recyclable or rechargeable or, you know, whatever, <laughs> right? <clears throat> um, you know, so very high bar all the way across. And then the question is, well, shoot, why would anyone want to start such a company? Well, precisely if you have a dream about revolutionizing an industry and you're not in it to hoard, but you're in it to do the opposite of hoarding, which is to feed the hungry. They're the people at the other end of the spectrum from the billionaires. And so, um, uh, and the idea is these will take market share away from the other companies. So uh, a, a triple C smartphone uh, manufacturer will take market share away from iPhone and not shed a single tear if these phones are in use for 30 years because they're in the business of selling phones. Their volume last year was zero. Now they're selling, you know, hundreds of thousands of units. They're happy and they don't care. <laughs> well, I, I mean, they do care, but they care about different things. Anyway, that's Triple C. Happy to, you know, would love to work together with your various organizations, Silas. And I, I really see an opportunity here to do an integrated holistic thing because with what we're going to be launching in Brooklyn, um, 
that's going to be a revolution. And it's going to be a revolution happening inside of New York City that's going to spread to all the boroughs and New York State, whole eastern seaboard. It's it's going to become the thing. So I'd really like to in, encourage all of us to look at that press conference and Brooklyn Eats and Operation Stone Soup. Look at all of that as a platform upon which we can together launch so many great things and you know use use our collective intelligence to integrate these together in the most efficient ways so aquarius currency triple c is a standard transforming all industries every single industry um and and you know there's a really important principle in marketing it's the second most important principle um in mar in marketing which is that you cannot little by little worm your way into somebody's mind and build a favorable position over time. You have to blast your way in, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna provide the blasting media um, at the press conference, and so let's just really make it count, and uh, you know consider all the different parties that we want at the table being part of the part of the messaging, and what that integrated message uh, should be. So anyway, just wanted to put all that out there. Um, but this will be the moment where we blast our way into the world's mind through the mouthpiece of New York City, the world, the news media capital of the world, and the default capital of the world, period, <laughs> right? Um, so, um, I mean, there's just so many mechanisms from taking an idea in New York and then <clears throat> taking it to the world. That's what New York has done. That's how New York sustains itself, is by exporting ideas, memes, uh, trends to the world. This will be no exception. And this will be homegrown, Brooklyn. I mean, it's just, woo, it's so cool. Anyway, I can go on and on, but there's two people in the queue, Ray and uh, Shankar, I believe. And uh, go for it, uh, either Silish or Ray. Anyway, I'm complete. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jamin. Hey, uh, just to add to what you just said, um, the, there are a lot of processes that we do today in making products that are toxic, fundamentally toxic. The processes themselves are toxic. So there's a lot of research that needs to be done to detoxify all our processes. And um, so I'm sort of uh, trying to corral my, uh, my engineering friends who are, who, have, who are from all kinds of professions to when you're retired, you know, go figure this out. Figure out detoxifying all these processes. Because so far you think it, there is no cost to it, right? Because hey, you know, I just put that uh, silicon tetrachloride over there. You know, it goes into somebody's water. <laughs> no, it's it's on the planet. So you figure out if you can do it without silicon tetrachloride, do it. Uh, that's the kind of Bell Labs we need now, a Bell Labs that detoxifies. You know, um, so a lot of research work that needs to be done. Okay, and, go ahead, Ray. And, but but now we have the standard also to promote it. We now have the equivalent of certified organic for food, but, or certified vegan for that matter, but now certified detoxified, essentially certified compassionate. That's the catch all. And that's why it's got such right. a rigorous stack of requirements. Anyway, right. uh, back to you, Ray. Mm -hmm. See, I love the C, the three C's, and it looks like you could put an earth right next to it. That will look really good. Oh, totally. That, that little tight triple C, it fits anywhere. It's very recognizable. Triple C, triple C, certified compassionate ah. company. It's like a big compassionate C. Anyway, um, lots, lots to discuss about that. But that's, see, now, now companies can, can get credit for it. See, see, up until now, Ray, I'm sorry for, <laughs> for cutting in here again. But see, up until now, each company has kind of had to tell its own story. And this is why we're great. And this right. and that. And you're there, you know, falling asleep halfway through the Patagonia article in National Geographic. I mean, it's a full page ad. You know, so it, uh, this way, it's just bam. Here, it, just like before, you had to try to figure out which foods are good or not. Now with certified organic, I mean, what a laugh, right? Because there's a lot of organic foods that are terrible for you um, that are certified organic. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, that's an example. It just gave a sweeping standard. Now you knew what to look for when you went to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's. If it's certified organic, it's good. You know, simple as that. This way we do that, but for the whole economy. Food, non-food, transportation, product, services, packaging, you name it. Bam, we got you covered. Triple C. Right. Is it triple C? Buy it. If not, boycott it. And that's how we take over the economy. 
one right. industry at a time, one product or service category at a time, just gobbling up market share. And um, the, the virtuous cycle, uh, which is which we define as the hungerless games, um, is where you know triple C companies like when they put community cafes all over Haiti and hunger is eradicated in Haiti, finally, right? Everyone's gonna who who done it? Well, the triple C companies. Well, where do I buy triple C? Well, there's basically a triple C Amazon. It's called Camazon or whatever. And um, it's all triple C. Yeah, just buy triple C. I only buy triple C now. Da, 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 da. You know, so, um, and, and then it'll be a runaway train, right? Yeah. Because I can it, imagine just. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, now, I was yeah, going to say that just triple just C products are the only ones that will have an Aquarius uh, footprint assigned to them. You know, so this way you're, that it's only those products that you can scan, you know, and when you're playing the Aquarius game, that's the one you can buy. Yeah, I've got more to say, but I'm going to hold my fire so Ray and Shankar can okay, talk, and I'll, I'll talk after. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sure. Not to mention, there's a lot of organic products that uh, use chicken litter, like use chicken refuse and, and uh, isn't exactly... Uh, um, pathogen, pathogen safe in that respect. So veganic is, is that next level. Uh, I was going to point out that uh, in our new economy group, we uh, a while back we were thinking, well, all this, whatever we say here is, is uh, pending what happens in the Aquarius group. What, it, what have we got to build with? What If we don't know about Aquarius, if we don't know all the pieces of what that's all about, we don't know what we could do. I realize it's really the reverse. And, and since we've decided to do the hierarchy of uh, the different groups in Vegan World 2026, Aquarius is a sub-circle of new economy. So it's actually up to us in new economy to start solving those shifts, m making those shifts happen to make the uh, to empower the Aquarius currency to be more powerful itself. Mm -hmm. So, what sort of things do we need to do? So, it is I, I guess it's a two way street that we we ask to make the Aquarius currency. What sort of things have to be removed? Um, what uh, what changes need to happen? removed oh no it's creating uh, cc triple c products and then uh, computing the ecological footprint of those triple c products well i mean the, the economy itself the, the existing economy this mm -hmm. this uh extractive uh violent economy we need to shift to that um non-violent economy where Aquarius currency will be king, uh, or many currencies. You mentioned that uh, having a variety of currencies is actually a strong thing for society. But uh, in the meantime, we got our our uh, we got to fight the the fight of the greenback and make shift changes. And that's always the trick. We can picture that utopia, but we can't figure out how to get from A to B without. Uh, uh, I should say A to C without B. Right. I was going to say B.5. <laughs> uh, so uh, one of the things is that the old system defends itself. The money system right now, the people who have the most money, they love the system and they're ready to defend it uh, to the death. Right. Is this, uh, I mean, this is one of the things that we have to, to approach it carefully and make it a game because it's uh, it could draw draw the wrong kind of attention, I suppose. Right. So it has so to be something that gets instantly popular when it's when it's time to really, uh, uh, you know, take the world by storm. Right. So this is why uh, you know I, I envision it as a game that has to be played along with the current money game. So it's not it's not a substitute for the money game. It's it's, a, it's an adjunct to the money game. And it's a game with, in which nothing is redeemable. It's not a currency in that sense. You can't redeem it for dollars or vice versa. This is why it's worth 
worthless in the current system, right? People say it's a worthless game people are playing. But when we play that game, we are actually literally changing the economy. Okay? We are changing what people produce. We are sort of favoring uh, certified compassionate products. So we are sort of making them change the, what they produce for us in the current game, in the current extractive economy. Because it's a supply demand issue. So when you demand more of this, people have to, they supply it. Someone will figure out how to supply it to you, right? And so uh, when you play this game, then it, uh, you are modifying the current system, okay? Just like by demanding vegan food, we modified the current system. So we know how powerful we are, you know? <laughs> we, we literally made a whole bunch of vegan restaurants show up and then we made Wendy's off of vegan food, you know? Or, Working off a of vegan food, right? That shows you how powerful we are, even though we are a minority, right? So knowing that, now you can say, well, you can change everything. You can change even how Apple behaves. You can change how Google behaves um, by playing this game. You can then extend our vegan mindset to other things, to our entire way of life. And so then, as more and more people go vegan, you become more and more powerful. And, and then eventually people just say, I don't want to play the other game anymore because I'm perfectly happy with this game of Aquarius. So then, you know, you're sort of moving from a currency that you had to go get from somewhere to a currency that's already coming to you automatically, right? So it just changes our um, way of thinking. Um, this is what Buckminster Fuller said. So we're just implementing things that have been known. Shankar? Yes, I, I, am, I was, I'm still coming from the financial side, uh, uh, being an accounting student or this thing. You call it as a net worth concept, like assets minus liabilities, like how much you have less how, how much you owe gives you your net worth and well, capitalism drives on that. So right. how you can maximize, the, it's not the asset they want to maximize, it's the, actually the net worth everybody wants to maximize. Right. So, uh, so I'm just uh, kind of a reframing, but uh, I, would, uh, I would request folks to even think about it and come up and make it even more poetic. See, if you see here, I'm just changing that as a, a bit abundance <laughs> mine as, Love equal to net earth. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> so somebody can refine it. So now people start thinking from the accounting, like the balance sheet or uh, I see asset, I see liabilities. But now I'm seeing, instead of seeing asset, I'm seeing abundance. Whatever mm -hmm. it is, abundance. The, instead of reducing, I'm saying minus you and me. <laughs> and love gives us what? Net earth. <laughs> yeah. And thriving uh, earth. Thank you for that. It's a yes. great play on words. Yes. Just to attract somebody interested in the accounting side right. <laughs> or the financial capitalist. That's it. That's all I want to share. Thank you. So when you get a chance, you know, please send any feedback on the white paper and we can um, um, refine it as we go along. This is one of the, I mean, both the white papers I want to put as a common resource that we can work on. And so initially it is a, a climate healers white paper. Then when it becomes a vegan world 2026 white paper, it's gone through the review process within, within Basecamp and it's gotten everybody's stamp of approval, so to speak. That's the way I envision it. Okay. Okay, Jamin. Thanks, Alish. So um, I wanted to talk about a key thing um, in marketing, which is uh, bifurcation, right? So I'd like to screen share and uh, show some visuals. And then I want to bring it right back to our situation right now and what we have in front of us and where we can go from here. But first, uh, here is a free lesson from the world of marketing. Uh, so bifurcation. So first there was just Coca-Cola, right? And then there was Coca-Cola and the Seven Dwarves. And then one of these tiny competitors <laughs> bifurcated the category, 
by creating a new dimension that has nothing to do with sugar water, but they pulled it off because it's a battle not over products, but over the mind. Marketing is a battle of the mind. So Pepsi bifurcated it into old and young, right? So now let's go from one category of food and beverage to the entire food industry. First, there was just food. Remember the days when there was just food? Okay, and then that got bifurcated into basically good food versus bad food. And this is a false dichotomy, okay? Totally false dichotomy, as Ray was pointing out, right? Uh, now let's go from the food industry to an entire sector. But first, actually, here, here's just some examples from organic. I mean, organic everything. It was actually Horizon that really kicked it off with the RBST scare. But then it just went to every category, every single category. If you want to do an all-American barbecue, you can do it 100% organic. You can even have organic briquettes. You can, you can bring your girlfriend organic flowers. And if you get lucky, you can sleep it off on an organic mattress. And at the end, you can finally light up with an organic cigarette. Finally, a cigarette that's good for you. All right, so <laughs> anyway, now let's go from uh, the food sector to an entire uh, service sector, the retail sector. First, there was just retail. There was stuff. You go to a store and you get stuff. And then it got bifurcated, All right? Now, what, now take this to the nth degree. Okay, so we've seen product categories. We've seen whole industries. We've seen whole sectors. Now that we're, what we're doing is we're taking it to the level of the entire economy. Right now, there's just the economy. It's all about, it's all about profit, 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 bottom line, bottom line, bottom line. We're bifurcating it. And we're giving people a choice. Now make it, make it healthy food. <laughs> and water, pure water, and healthy food. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. Anyway, so now, there's a so, healthy cola. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was I was thinking a cola that's in a reusable bottle, like the old cola bottles that's sweetened with with stevia, you know, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but you know, and maybe yeah, there is this. <laughs> yeah, <that isn't. laughs> bad, 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 bad example, but anyway, now right. taking it to or, taking it to our six the healthy cola. <laughs> <laughs> so all right now taking this to our situation right here right now um when we launch and have our press conference they basically say listen we're making we're making nutritious immune boosting plant-based foods a basic human right and we're going to feed everyone here in brooklyn what we're then doing is we're creating a bifurcation between those who believe that you know, food should be something that you buy with money if you have it, and if you don't, then you do without, versus that it should be a basic human right. That's going to provoke right. a confrontation, right? See, because right. pr prior to this moment, prior to the press conference, everyone just goes around assuming, well, that's, you know, you want food, you got to buy it. I mean, that's just the way it works, right? right? What, are the farmer's going to do it for free? Of course not, you know. And so we come along and we bifurcate that. It's going to create a confrontation. Um, and the, the confrontation will, I'm just going to use Rush Limbaugh as, as a kind of almost a cartoon character. Imagine he said, you know, he just takes a strong stand against this and says, this is, this is communism. And this is, this is, this is disrupting the free market and people are going to lose jobs. And, you know, this is terrible. Right. And, I'll, and great. We challenge him to a debate. Right. We, we have the debate and, you know, we simply talk about, you know, starvation and, brain damage from starvation and permanent disabilities resulting from i mean it's just it's it's absurd right and then talk about the virus and the spreading of the virus but in china they figured out how to solve this from the from the get-go everybody stay at home and we'll bring you the food boom right so we get to bifurcate and basically win the war over should you know food be bought with money or should it be free uh, should it be a basic human right? We're going to win that war and we're going to bifurcate it. And then that bifurcation is fundamentally going to be about a world of love and compassion and regeneration and healing and, you know, ongoing viability versus you know, a world that's just killing itself and everything 
uh, on it in the in the process you know and and that's going to be the most powerful bifurcation ever not just in the economy but in thought in in philosophy in belief um in paradigm i mean it's just it's going to be such a clean bifurcation and what you're going to and, and okay. but what we're going to do is we're going to create a pathway an easy pathway for people to go from one side to the other to the from the from the dark side to the to the side of healing and that's going to be this whereas before say in the you know the mid 80s the reagan years they might have said oh you know you know everyone should get a job and da da da, da and we we don't want communism and and they could have a defensible position in the mid 80s in the reagan in the go go reagan years but in 2020 with all that's going on now they've got a very easy exit from that position which is to say you know what given the whole virus and pandemics and all that you know, and that, you know, much of the economy is kind of at, at a standstill, a ground to a halt. Um, this is simply the right thing to do. I used to think one way about hunger and capital, and now I think a different way. You know, it's an easy out because the game has, because the circumstances have changed, right? Um, but there will be some diehard holdouts, right? Yeah. And that's where it gets really fun because, um, you know, Oh, Jackie's got to go. All right. Hey, Jackie, great to see you, sister. Yeah, you have, you have the last word. Go for it. Sorry. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Can... Bye. Thanks, great, Jackie. Great to see you, Jackie. All right. We'll see, we'll see you soon. <laughs> but, you know, th this is going to be the, the confrontation of uh, this is the great showdown between fundamentally the paradigm of hoarding and the paradigm of healing and sharing, right, and compassion. Right. And, uh, you know, note and and it's not coming a moment too soon we need this grand confrontation right of thought of belief of paradigm of philosophy uh to happen let's get it on because we know who's going to win that debate we know right. it's so clear and it but it'll be won before it starts because the media is going to show all the trucks delivering the food and the mothers crying as the as food is delivered now they can feed their babies i mean it's just going to be it's going to go on and on and on it's going to be the feel-good story of our of our of our species. It'll be the moment when our species finally, you know, dug its head out of the sand of our reptilian or origins, where we're afraid of everyone and everything, and we're just trying to you know hoard, and it's me against the world, and and that's what it became: me against the world. I acted against the world in order to promote me, right? And then you know, death by a, a million pinpricks. Uh, Mother Earth couldn't take it anymore. Well, when we finally get our head out of our our heads out of our reptilian, you know what's our reptilian holes, um, we that's when we were able to come together and say there's got to be a new way, right? Silas, you took the lead, and we all came together, and we all just started mixing it up together and morphing and morphing and co-creating, and voila, the press conference happens. <laughs> which is which really awesome. will be seen it'll be seen as a revolution but it'll be a bloodless revolution in a day why because that story is going to go around the world immediately there is no way and manhattan is, is going to erupt in conversation about it in debate about it wait a second this is disrupting the whole american way of free markets and da -da 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 -da. you know uh really about food what should we do the same thing with water fire departments police you know you know come on and and so this will be this this a revolution in compassion a revolution of hope as president vicente fox wrote in his book by the same title right a revolution of healing a revolution of intelligence a revolution of so many things this becomes the moment when the imaginal cells really come together because this is going to be a dog whistle to all the imaginal cells Come join the collective intelligence. And if we've been able to do this with a, with a you know a couple dozen of us at a time, can you imagine when there's tens of millions of us responding to the dog whistle and saying, "Wow, I'm in." And then we really start organizing ourselves as an intelligent network, right? That's constantly reconfiguring itself, and the bumblebees are hopping from flower to flower. And this is where we really jump into the new age, right? And accelerate past all of these life-threatening problems you know once we get through the bottleneck we're going to look back and laugh 
that any of this was a struggle for us. <laughs> and it'll be, and for the people that didn't live through it, they'll be, it'll just be almost impossible to imagine the barbaric world that we came from, from 2019. The barbarism. I mean, we'll just cringe, you know, because it was just a few years ago. It'll be like Ger Germany, you know, living through and ultimately beyond its their Nazi years, right? We're all not, we're, we, we all came through, we're all Hitler youth, recovering Hitler youth, all of us uh, from, from the old paradigm. Anyway, I'm complete. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we are running over time. So it's probably a good time to say thank you all very, very much. And uh, we'll meet again tomorrow at the New Economy Group and on Friday for the KMAMA app from 11 to 1. And um, hopefully I'll have more updates for you. Awesome. 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 Wow. Well, I'm happy right. to, to keep the space open. If, more, if folks have more to say, go, go ahead, Ray. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that I, I'm just playing back the answer when I asked what new economy can do for uh, Aquarius. You didn't seem to think it, that you need anything, that the Aquarius was going, like we originally su suspected, was going to drive and change the economy itself as it goes. So I don't know. Do we need the new economy meeting? <laughs> no, I mean, we do need to think about these compassionate, certified compassionate corporations. I mean, how do you uh, promote them? You know, how do you get them going? So it's, there is a lot of work to be done. And, and it's also, you know, getting, um, getting all this new work done about uh, creating these certified compassionate processes. Yeah, if anybody wants to join the new economy group, let me know and I can sign you up so you can join because last week we, we uh, had a really good meeting without our leader, Keith Akers is the, is the leader, and we didn't record it, but Silas joined and it was such a great conversation that I said we should do it again next week. So we, uh, we had a, even rehearsed this meeting. <laughs> right. So you can message me if you want to be added to the new economy group. All right. Thank you all very, hey, go ahead. Oh, I got more to say, but but for those who want to go, I don't want to hold anyone over time. So, uh, but I wanted to share about how we can get I have this whole new economy. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, Shankar. I have to head it up. Yeah, I, I sure, will join sure. tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Sure, sure. Thank you, Shankar. All right. See you soon, buddy. Um, I just wanted to show a few quick slides about how we, in the past, have envisioned this going. Now that's all changing radically with Operation Stone Soup. But um, let me just kind of show where we came from with, uh, with Triple C. So um, again, Triple C and, um, you know, it, it, as to where does the money go? Where exactly do these profits go to feed everyone? So we, we pioneered in Southern California, the community cafe um, where we feed everyone nutritious foods for free, just make it a, a, a basic human right. Uh, also partnering with local restaurants, they, they produce the food. And this all feeds into the overall mega strategy of the Hungerless Games, right? Where profits go to community cafes and other outlets, we end hunger, it becomes a huge story. And, we're, and Brooklyn is, is just gonna be bam, that's where this thing just takes off. That's why I say a revolution in a day. And then, but not so much centered around triple, I mean, Triple C will, that'll take its own evolutionary path, but feeding Brooklyn is really where the, where the bifurcation happens. Then all that, what that really does is it clears the, it, it clears the space for Triple C and Aquarius, et cetera, to go in. So what is the, what is the world's first Triple C company? My brother, Takuya Sato, whose family, the Sato family, um, have been in hemp for like, like a, something like over a dozen generations way back into the Edo period. And, um, you know, even through prohibition and all that, they've, they've kept the, the tradition alive. So um, my brother Takuya Sato is the leader of the hemp industry in Japan. And um, he is the hemperer of Japan. And, he's, and they, he signed up his family namesake to be the world's first triple C company. So, uh, you know, we've got some really great stories and hemp is, is, you know, <laughs> hemp is to, uh, 
uh, textiles, what veganism is to food, um, it's infinitely better than cotton by any measure. It sequesters more carbon, returns nutrients to the soil. Uh, cotton does the opposite. It uses a fraction of the water, yada, yada, yada. Uh, really good stuff. Um, so anyway, there, there, there's so many ways we can go, but it's basically about, you know, compassion and healing uh, versus, uh, versus hoarding. And um, I just want to show the beginning of a video. I think I'm going to have to, let's see, take out my headsets to do this. Um, but all of this uh, went into, so here's a video about the Hungerless Games. It's, it's actually pretty short, but I'll just uh, share the beginning of it. Um, there we are, the Hungerless Games. In 1972, as the Apollo 17 crew left Earth's orbit for the moon, they shot this famous photograph. After hundreds of thousands of years of human... ...have a vision for our world. all its inhabitants, healthy and complete, where everyone is taken care of. So I'm sorry, you guys, I, I, I messed up there a little bit <laughs> on the technical and stuff. Put the link on the chat. You can take a look oh, at Oh, yeah, th th there you go. But well, here, let me, okay, yeah, that, that's fair. Let, let me do that, and then people can watch it when, when, you, when you feel like it. But it's uh, a super cool video about the Hungerless Games and just the whole paradigm. Um, there it is. Yeah. Anyway, I, I know people need to go. It's, um, it's dinner time for folks, so let, don't let me hold you any longer. But what a great meeting, everyone. And um, so excited that um, that we're just in this, you know, network. Thank of you for your energy. Pardon? Thank you for your energy. <laughs> Thank you, Silas. Listen, we're all we're all boosting each other. With, with, with all of our energy. It's the collective that's just making everything possible that wasn't possible before. So here we are, Imaginal Cells Unite, and uh, let's get it done. <laughs> it sounds, sounds good. That, by the way, says ICU, Imaginal Cells Unite. I see you, I see you, wow, I like it. I see you. I see. It also I see is you. intensive intensive care unit, you know. <laughs> well, and then the and then the upgraded version of ICU is ICU two. You know, that's where it gets reflected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Talk to you soon. Awesome, Silas. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Have a great evening. Yeah. All right, I'm going to pause recording. All right, after a brief pause, we were saying goodbye to a couple of folks. Uh, back to you, Emery. Yeah, I was just saying that the energy that, uh, <clears throat> you know, that happens is kind of fuels itself. And, uh, you know, the convergence of all, all of the energy that people, people come and bring into the conversations that, uh, that are constantly ongoing now, you know, and... Uh, increasingly so right so uh you know i am very i can see everything working out you know it's, it's the, there's a very positive progression of involvement um you know so it's a good sign i think and we should just keep at it and uh you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be a success. We're going to save life on this planet. You know, we're going to feed, uh, we're going to feed the planet. We're going to feed life. This is how we feed life and uh, ensure our, our, our existence uh, into the future. 
Okay. Yeah, and to that, I would add that the hour is all of life, right? We're going to ensure that all of life, or as much of life as can be saved, right? Exactly. Um, you know, we're, we're like a cargo ship in that movie, The Perfect Storm, where whole containers, whole 40-foot containers are just sliding off the deck and into the ocean. So we're losing brother and sister species as we go, but the point is to not give up the fight and stop the damage as soon as we can, as quickly and as thoroughly as we can. So we stop this hemorrhaging of species uh, to extinction um, and get us back onto a holistic, beautiful new course, right? So it's the vi ensuring the, the ongoing viability of as much life as we can possibly save. Well, this is feeding life, feeding all life, not just, not just uh, humanity, but uh, all, of, uh, all of life that supports, supports the, the true joy that we experience in life, in our lives and, um, you know, in, in, which we lead uh, together with all of the existing life on the planet. So, you know, it's all important to, uh, to keep this harmonious, harmonious, uh, progressive work that uh, is, is, uh, is being seated in all our hearts and, and minds and uh, I see, uh, I see uh, just true, honest goodness coming, coming from it and it should inspire people, you know, to do the right things as we proceed. And, uh, and with that, uh, let's continue. Continue on. And, uh, and be mindful of what, what, what we uh, wish to accomplish. Yeah, that, that's why for me it all starts with the conversation, which starts with the question, how do we save life on Earth? See, that's the question we've been dancing around, you know, I think for the most part, pretending that it's not the question of the moment, pretending that it doesn't exist, pretending that, oh, you know, if we just make a little tweak here and a little tweak there, we'll just kind of stay the course and, you know, that we're not heading for the Niagara Falls, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we ha we've been collectively delusional and in, in collective denial about how bad it is and the magnitude of our responsibility to each other and to all of life in this moment. Exactly. I mean, we could put the question out there in, 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 uh, in our uh, social media. We'll put it out. You know, when you're doing a post on Facebook, just uh, put the question out there for people to respond. You're able to comment. You're able to provide uh, your, uh, your answer and your thoughts. And, um, you know, as a collective uh, intelligence, we're all uh, able to look at, look at our answers and, uh, and work on them, you know, bring them to reality. Bring them to the block party. We can talk about it. Right, Jamie? Yeah, yeah, super cool. Yep. Yeah, that's it. Bring it to the block party. And, uh, but I think with, with uh, Brooklyn Eats, um, we've got the platform, the vehicle for bringing together so many different communities and planning. The, the way I see it, this is, this is the 
um, the coming out to the world of the new way, the new paradigm, the new model, the new reality. This is, this is the moment that the world was put on notice that there is a new reality. And, um, and here's what it is. And it starts with the question, how do we save life on earth? And it, as of this moment, that's an unanswered question. We have an answer. It's called Operation Stone Soup. We're not supposing it's the best answer, but it's the best one we've seen. And here's what it is. And it starts right here in Brooklyn. And here's what we're doing here. We're doing Brooklyn Eats. Da -da 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 -da, all the details. And then from here, we're recruiting, you know, people from all over the world to participate in the collective intelligence to help Brooklyn Eats be just phenomenally successful and create a model which can be replicated and built upon and modified and added to open source style, right? Um, and, uh, you know, but we're starting here, spreading to the world, de de evolving from collective intelligence to collective super intelligence, and then applying that to cooling the planet via SRM. Bam, bam, bam. There you have one, two, three. Food, intelligence, and cooling, right? Food, pandemics, intelligence, and cooling. I mean, it's just like, wow, 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 wow. That just, it hits all the check boxes, the major check boxes. And then we, and then, you know, of course, planetary healing is included because we're eliminating, you know, we're going plant-based. So it's really food, uh, pandemics, planetary healing, collective intelligence, and cooling the planet. Right. It's just like, wow, you know, five gigantic check boxes in one holistic process, just for starters. And then with collective superintelligence, we go from there to wherever we need to go in terms of solutions and opportunities and whatnot. So anyway, that's for me, the big, big, big story here. Amazing story. And, um, You know, and it's mm -hmm. it's, um, it's an amazing story. It, this is nothing more than uh, it's it's a miracle in in progress. That's you exactly know? it. It's a that's it. Yeah, it's, that's what it is. Because we're working it out. we're working it out. That's really. it. That's it. Yeah, the soup is open. It's it's open for it. Yeah, we're adding stuff to the to the cauldron all the time now. And I wouldn't be surprised if the media or some portion of the media conveys this to the world as the solution. There's a group in Brooklyn that basically says they have the solution to our problems. Plural. Why? We hit pandemics, hunger and malnutrition right planetary healing planetary cooling collective super intelligence it's just like whoa whoa, whoa 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 christmas came way early and it came a hundred times bigger than i was expecting it right whoa you know it's like you know and why the hell not this is a hyper solution and in fact in launching this hyper solution and putting it in its proper context, everything I wrote in the email that I sent last night, um, we define hyper solution. And, and because of all that, because this is the first hyper solution, remember law number one of the 22 immutable laws of marketing, it's better to be first than it is to be better. Law number one. And so we, create the world's first hyper solution. And when you're the market leader in a new segment like that, in a new category of, in this case, the category of the hyper solution, um, being the first, oh, Operation Stone Soup is the first hyper solution in that category. When you are the leader, you don't promote your own brand, you promote the category. So we'll promote the conversation out of which multiple hyper solutions can be born. But of all those multiple, there will always and forever only be one first, and that's Operation Stone Soup. 
Yeah. And no one's going to be last, Jamin. No one will be last. Yeah. We're all, we're all, we're all in, you know. You know what I mean? All in. Yeah. We're all, we're all in it together. And, exactly. Exactly. And for the first time, and thanks largely to this new medium. Relatively new. I'm, I'm so thankful. Uh, I'm so thankful for uh, for this, uh, Jim. Really, am. <laughs> Thank you, know, you. I've been living with a very heavy heart. You know? and, uh, is this is a new there's a new uh meaning for hope i i would imagine in all of this hope has been uh, you know it's been given different definitions uh, in recent days in recent times so i'm gonna redefine hope give it something something really uh, really true you know, we want, we want hope to ring true and believe it, believe in it again. I want to believe in hope again. Bring, bring this to reality. Bring these, these feelings that we have and visions to reality. happening. Yeah, and I think the timing couldn't be more perfect because, you know, you and I have this hunger for hope again. There's a whole bunch of people who are so attached and embedded in the current matrix that they still don't know that there's a problem. <laughs> Right. And they're, you know, they're waiting for things to go back to normal and back to normal, back to business as usual. And then, you know, everything can just continue on. And um, they're going to be sorely disappointed at some point this summer. And I don't know exactly when that's going to be. But at some point this summer, I think the news will hit that and become widely known that we're in deep doo doo, not no temporary blip, but serious doo doo pie. And, um, What's then going to happen is this hunger for hope and hunger for solutions will just reach a fever pitch. And there in the dog days of summer, bam, we, we hit the world with this press conference. And suddenly the world is talking mega solutions, hyper solutions, Operation Stone Soup ending hunger, ending pandemics, cooling the planet, going super intelligent. Suddenly there's reason for hope. There's cause for hope. Just as, just as you articulated, Emery, but everyone's, but not everyone, but vast swaths of humanity are going to have that experience that you're having and feel that gratitude that you're feeling. And uh, it's just, that's, that's going to be the tipping point right there. Right there. When people feel the hunger and then feel that hunger satisfied by what we're offering. I'm all in there. I'm, I'm with you, Jamin. We'll work on this. Right. I'm, uh, I'm at a loss of words, man. I'm just so grateful. Thank you, man. Thank you, Emery. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's mind-boggling, and what it took to get here. It's quite a journey. Quite a journey. And uh, thankfully, we're just really coming into our own, and it just it's so it feels so perfect, you know.
and it, and I also find I finally feel like we've got the right framework for it, which in hindsight it seemed like it was hiding in plain sight. How do we save life on Earth? Let's have the conversation, all right? Let's birth the hyper solution, whatever hyper solution or hyper solutions are needed out of that conversation, and let's implement. Let's execute, right? It's just like in hindsight, it was kind of obvious. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we're talking about, we're talking about and de defining it in a simple, simplistic, in simplistic ways. You know, this is how simple it was. It is. You know, it just it is simple. We just have to do it. You know, and. Uh, We're, we're, we're doing it. That's all. It's the only way to describe the moment is that uh, we're doing it. Like yeah. it or not, we're, we're making a dent. Like it or not, it's coming. And a dent that's going to turn into just a, a river yeah. of, of transformation. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, the, the, the action um, in the arena right now is exactly what we're doing. It's having the conversation, figuring it out, working out every last detail. That's the action in the arena. Yeah, and I, you know, and over the, over the course of all, all of the conversations, you know, I, uh, I personally, I see the transformations, you know, it's, it, it is a transforming, very fluid kind of thing, you know, it, it just, it just seems to happen all the time at the, the right moment, something comes into, into view and, and, and it shifts and, you know, go there in, in that direction, you know, it's, it's truly a miracle in progress. When, you, when, when you're going to look back at it, you know, to, to, you couldn't have planned this out. In a, in, you would have had to be in it to actually understand what, what exactly happened. I'm going to look back on this for sure. Well, we're going to be joy. We're going to be very joyful that you know we had the nerve to do this. That's what takes takes a lot of nerve, and uh, you know, and you're you're strong, man. You're strong. Jamie, you're strong here. I, so motivating, you know, and, and 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 so many people, so many people that that you know that come together. They're all very motivating, motivating each other to carry it forward. To pay it forward, as they say, you know. You know, and, if, and especially with what what we what we're aware of, you know, it's it's amazing. Well, you know. If you think back to our ancestors, um, I think the way that we made it through the ice ages and through very, very difficult periods in evolutionary history, um, it's pretty clear to, you know, to me, if not to anthropology and whatnot, that, in fact, I saw an article in, in Scientific American about it that basically said, you know, how did we make it as a species? And the answer was cooperation, right? 
uh, collective intelligence. And so what's emergent here that looks so amazing to us, right, may actually be built into us, right? And that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of the Harlem Globetrotters and just the art and the grace with which the ball floats around to the different players. Um, they're actually based in Arizona, I think near Phoenix. That's where they do their practice and everything, even though they're the Harlem Globetrotters. Um, they, and I actually spent an evening with them in Mexico, uh, took them around and it was quite a trip. But so what, I just use that as an example, but there's just, there's a way that we flow together, you know, in conversation when we come together with a shared intention and it just sort of works, right? Even though, you know, look at, we've had like something like people from 20 different countries participating in the block party, right? In the 14 block parties that we've had, right? And um, so it's like, no matter where you're from, no matter what your culture, origin, whatever, um, we, you know, we can very quickly start flowing together. And we now get to experience this with Zoom in a way that we didn't before. See, because before, you know, look, I come from the San Francisco Bay Area and um, I grew up with people from all across the world. Uh, my best friend was black growing up and nobody thought anything of it, right? That was, it was just the most diverse place on earth. But here's the thing, all those people had come from whatever country, Bangladesh, China, whatever, they had all come to the Bay Area. So that was a whole filter, right? Now we get to connect with people in their countries of origin, no matter where they are, but exactly as they are without anyone having ha had to travel. So it's like we all get to interact with each other where we're each sitting in our own home environment, right? See how that's radically different than if let's say Emory, you had taken a trip to the San Francisco Bay Area and we met there, right? You're now a Canadian on holiday in California and I'm a California native in California, that's different than you being in your, in your home and you're in your community. In this case, Montreal, Canada, right? Same with my brother, Melvin. He's at home in Arizona, right? And so we all get to participate from our own home, which is very empowering. And it just a whole, it's just like, in what place is this conversation happening? It's happening in three different places and probably a fourth if you consider that it's happening really up in the cloud, if anywhere, right? We've all been teleported to the cloud. So we're just in this whole new modality of, of sharing and co-creation. From one standpoint, it's a whole new modality from the standpoint of technology, but from the standpoint of people coming together and working together in times of crisis, like the ice ages, the ice age, right? Um, I think it's built into us. You know, we got all these like mirror neurons and all this cool stuff going on that it's really wired into us to, to co-create, to collaborate, to share, right? To cooperate. You know, it's a cooperation. It's a cooperative for, for sure. Right? And, uh, if, I, if I may uh, play a video there, to to, uh, to uh, cap this episode out is uh, be uh, apropos because uh, yeah go go for it Emery go for I it see, I see the something beautiful at at the end the end here and, uh, I'll be off screen for just a couple of seconds got to refill but I'll be listening I'm listening I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be I'll be right back.
Super cool, Emery. Hey, is that is that by chance uh, in Ontario near where you grew up? No, it's it's uh, it's not. Uh, it's something that the Tin Man, the Tin Man found on the internet, and you know, the Tin Man is always looking for rainbows, you know, and uh, trying to fix his heart. Because, you know, Tin Man had some problems with the heart, right? So Tin Man's always looking for these rainbows and found that one to be uh, very beautiful, you know. So I'm glad to share it and happy to share it. Awesome. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Emery. Wow. Hmm. Hmm. You need to get Go ahead. Pardon? Go ahead. Oh. Um. Oh, I was just saying, it looks like it's time for me to uh go have dinner with melissa and uh but um you know i just wanted to share one final thought um which is this new modality of sharing like we're like we're doing um It uh, it reminds me of uh, the movie Pele. I think it came out just in the last few years, like 2016 or something like that, about Pele, the soccer player from Brazil. And they had a style um, that at first was ridiculed, but it was called the Jenga style uh, from uh, of, of Brazil. And it was developed by escaped slaves, slaves who escaped from the planta plantations and went into the Brazilian jungle to survive. And they came up with, it was like a martial art that they used to, you know, to keep from getting captured again to survive. Um, and then that martial art was outlawed. To, uh, and it had a name, I forget what it was. But anyway, um, so the, the ones who had been practicing it kept it alive through, pardon me? Capoeira. That's it. Capoeira. That's it. Capoeira. Exactly. So, um, but they kept it alive through soccer, right? Um, because soccer wasn't illegal, right? And so they, they, they imported that capoeira style of martial art into soccer, and that became the basis for Jenga. And, um, but it was kind of ridiculed and all that, ha ha. Um, but then Pele came along and at age 17, basically won the World Cup for Brazil, right? And uh, greatest, you know, he was voted athlete of the century by the Olympics committee. I mean, just phenomenal, phenomenal. But that movie shows how he, with support from his father and this, another older uh, retired soccer star, uh, who recruited Pele into the Santos soccer um, uh, uh, team. And, um, and it just the journey of taking this style that had been ridiculed and then to conquer the world of soccer with it by a 17 year old boy. Incredible. Anyway, if you haven't seen the movie, I highly recommend it. All right. I, I got to head in. Love you guys. What a great day. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Much love, man. Thank you, Jamin. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you. All right. You guys Bye. have a great night. We'll see you on Friday at the block party. Okay. All right. Love you guys. Take Bye. care. Thanks. Bye, Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye.